I mean, you should really look at the screen and not so much me. Look, you know, I'm, I, the, the astronomy is much more, much better to look at. We can bring more chairs if you need. Oh, we got two good things. Perfect. So first, I would. Um, so I like to meander a little bit. So hopefully, if I meander a little bit too far from the microphone, you'll still be able to hear me, okay? Um, but. I first would like to thank the uh, SFAA for this invitation and this opportunity to talk to you about this, um, what I think is really interesting and amazing work. Um, and it's also wonderful to just see so many of you here who have this shared interest in uh, astronomy and astrophysics, um, because I think personally, this is one of the reasons why we do this work, which is yes, to like push the frontiers of science, so to speak, but also because astronomy in my mind goes back to the fundamental questions of human existence. Why are we here? Where did we come from? Where are we going? What does it all mean? Um, and so I think it's absolutely fantastic and wonderful that um, all of you are here. And again, I really do thank the SFAA for um, their invitation and for also the um, lovely dinners. I really do appreciate it. <laughs> uh, so yes, I am not too far down the road. I'm at San Jose State University, part of the CSU system, if you're unfamiliar with it. Um, one of the things I wanna start off with is, yes, I am here talking to you about this work, but work with the James Webb really is a broad, international collaboration. There's no way that we can do this type of work um, without a group of scientists from around the world all collaborating and working together. And I highlighted in the bottom left and just one small part of it. Um, but my part, uh, as I will talk about a little bit later, is um, I help to contribute to the theoretical understanding and interpretation of the observations and to some extent the modeling as well. Okay, so in the title, there's this thing that says uh, Wolf Ray Star. So what is a Wolf Ray Star? So just off the top of my head, does anyone here know what a Wolf Ray Star is or have any idea what it is? Yeah. Perfect, okay, you can come up and text. <laughs> <laughs> it barks very loud. It, actually, yeah. you're not far off from the truth and I'll explain exactly what that means. And it goes like, oh. <laughs> it, it might actually. Uh, okay, so um, O stars, so if you are unfamiliar, so on the right here we have uh, what we would consider maybe a typical main sequence O star. So that is a star that has, uh, it's basically living its life happily, fusing hydrogen into helium and eventually up to other elements. Um, these are the most massive main sequence type stars that exist in the, uh, in the universe, at least in the local universe. Um, they typically have masses about 30 times um, the mass of the sun, although they can be, a, you know, there's some fluctuation in that, but they can definitely go a lot higher than this. Um, they are known for being the hottest type of um, normal, quote unquote, normal star that exists. What I mean by that is, um, Temperatures on the order of like say 30,000 Kelvin or more. To give you an idea, by the way, when I'm talking about these stars, if you look in the upper left, there's our neighbor, our friendly neighborhood star, the sun. Um, this diagram is to scale. So that is how big an O star actually is physically compared to say the sun. And then the temperature, the surface temperature of the sun you can see is about just under 6,000 Kelvin. So these things are significantly hotter they are a lot more luminous, much, much brighter than the sun, um, at least 10,000 times brighter than the sun, up to maybe millions of times brighter than the sun. Um, they are extremely rare. Massive stars are the lowest abundance in the universe, at least in the local universe. Um, what I mean by that is in the neighborhood of the sun, less than one in two million stars is an O star. So they're very rare. 
Um, unfortunately, that makes them very difficult to study because we don't have as many of them to look at. Because they are so bright, they don't live very long. So they only live on the order of maybe 10 million years. Um, our sun, for, exist, for example, lives on the order of 10 billion years. So um, these are kind of the rock stars of stars because they live fast and die young. They literally just burn through their fuel, and um, before you know it, they explode in these gigantic explosions where um, they go supernova, and the reason they're important is because they spew the heavy elements that they made in their course out into space so that gravity can eventually pull all of that stuff back together and form things like um, the Russell Museum and the audience in it. <laughs> Okay, now the big question is, what happens in between being a nice, happy O star, just living its life, burning through its fuel, and the time when it becomes a supernova? So, we believe that there is this phase after when the star has basically used up most of its fuel in its core, and it becomes what we call a wolf ray star. So a wolf ray star is the descendant of a massive O star. They typically are 20 times the mass of the sun or more. They are extremely hot, even hotter than an O star. The reason for that being they have actually blown off the outer parts of their atmosphere and the hotter layers that are deeper inside are now exposed. So they're hotter. Um, they are, because they're hotter, they're more luminous and an interesting fact that we will get to that's kind of the crux of this talk is they have what's called a strong stellar wind. So when we had this audience member say that these things howl, well, they kind of do because they're actually blowing material off into space constantly through this stellar wind because they're just so fantastically bright. And I'll talk about that in a second on the next slide. Now, because they're so bright, they are losing a lot of mass continuously in this stellar wind that blows off into space and the mass loss rates can be between they can be about 10 to the minus 5 suns a year up to about um, 10 to the minus 3 suns a year so that means they're losing an equivalent of a sun every say thousand years to hundred thousand years just in their stellar wind outflow okay so what is a stellar wind um, Stars are basically just a tug of war. That's all they really are. It's a tug of war between gravity, trying to push, pull everything in, and what's called the radiation force, which is all of the energy that's being created inside the star trying to escape the star outward. So all of that radiation coming out basically tries to blow the star apart, but gravity balances that. And when a star is in happy equilibrium, it will just sit there in this equilibrium for a long time um, until something disturbs that equilibrium and then things go haywire. Now, massive stars have this special property where they are so bright that the radiation coming off of them can actually impart a force on the material that exists around the star and blow that stuff into space at millions of miles an hour. And it does this constantly throughout the star's life. What this means is that a massive star can lose a lot of material during its life, in, blowing it out into space continuously, and it can actually lose about half of its starting mass in its short few million year lifetime. Now, to give you some context of why this is actually pretty spectacular, let's go back to our neighborhood star, the sun, the sun's mass loss rate, the sun, even as bright as it is, it's amazingly actually not bright enough to drive a radiation-driven stellar wind. It doesn't actually happen for the sun. The solar wind is actually just due to the fact that we have a hot ball of gas in space, and it's what's called a gas pressure-driven wind. It's basically just how hot, hot gas in a vacuum in that vacuum of space just pulls material off of the sun. So the sun's mass loss is significantly smaller. So small, the sun only will lose 0.01% of its mass 
via its stellar wind over its entire 10 billion year life. That's basically nothing. So as far as the sun is concerned, we don't care. It doesn't matter, right? It just makes no difference basically what, almost at all. But for a massive star, it's important because what happens when a star dies, like whether it becomes a neutron star or a black hole, is determined by its mass right before it dies. And so if we want to understand things like the formation of neutron stars, black holes, the evolution of the chemical evolution of the universe, we need to understand this process of how stars lose mass. So what does this look like? Because we're here for an astronomy talk, we want to see pretty pictures. Uh, this is an example of what it looks like. Um, this is a NASA Hubble Space Telescope image where there is a massive star almost near the center of the image. And then you see this kind of bubble that surrounds the star. That bubble is the stellar wind coming off of the star and then colliding with and interacting with the surrounding interstellar medium. And then we can kind of see the edge of the bubble is where it piles up. Um, you may say, well, if this is a bubble, why isn't it censored on the star? That's an excellent question. The reason is, is because part of it is just our viewing angle from the Earth. But more importantly, if you look kind of more to the, uh, to the upper left, you see that there's kind of like more material here. It's because the interstellar medium in this direction just happens to have more stuff there. And it acts like a wall. And so this bubble on this side comes up and just happens to hit it earlier before it can, where on this side to the bottom right, it's mostly, it's more empty. And so the bubble can kind of travel in that direction more easily. Um, but this is what it looks like. And we see this a lot. We see these bubbles um, around massive stars a lot. Okay, now here's where it gets interesting. Stars like friends. Most stars in the universe actually um, are not single stars by themselves. They typically come in pairs or maybe even triples or uh, quadruplets. The sun is actually another unique situation because we only have one star nearby in our solar system. Now, as you go to more and more massive stars, the stars actually um, have more and more companions. So something like 98 percent of massive stars typically have a binary companion or maybe even a triplet companion. So they usually come in pairs. Now what's interesting is if you have a system where each star is a massive star and each star has a stellar wind, what do you think is going to happen to those two winds when they get blown off into space? Anyone want to guess? Bubbles. Yeah, bubbles definitely will happen. What else? Anyone else? Collisions. Say that again? Collisions. Yes, collisions. That's exactly right, too. Yes, so bubbles are one, and then also collisions. Um, and so what ends up happening is the winds from each star go off into space, and then, bam, they slam together. Um, and they will form what's called um, a bow shock. So does anyone here go boating? How many of you go boating or sailing? Right? Does that word bow sound familiar to you? Yes, it's the exact same thing if you stand at the front of a ship and you were to look over the edge as the ship is going through the water, there's this little wave pattern or whatever that gets at the front of the boat that kind of gets, that's the bow shock. That's where this comes from. It's very, it's almost the same physics. So what ends up happening is um, the wind comes off of one of the stars and it basically collides with and hits the wind of the other. Now, the two stars in the binary system are usually not always exactly equal. And so what happens is, is one of the stars, the wind is usually maybe a little bit stronger than the other. And so it kind of pushes it backwards a little bit. And you get this kind of um, almost like boomerang shape, right? And um, basically what will happen, and I kind of give it away a little bit here in this little caption, but what we're going to find is that the material flowing along this shock, this shock here, um, first, it starts off really hot, but then it also cools down when it flows away from the stars. And when it cools off, that's when all of the really cool stuff happens that we'll talk about in a second. Now, I wanted to show you what this actually looks like in time. So my background is actually in computational astrophysics. And the thing that I've spent a lot of time doing is 
trying to do supercomputer simulations to model this effect. So that's what I wanted to show you because it's also really cool to look at. Um, so first, let's just start with um, the left-hand panel. So what are we actually looking at? So the easiest way to picture this is imagine that you're hovering in space above the two stars and you're looking down on them from above, okay? Now, the two stars in this picture are actually really tiny and you almost can't see them. The first one is at the very center of this image, and it is the, it is the star that has the stronger stellar wind. And then there's another smaller star that's in orbit around this big star, and it is also blowing its own stellar wind. And as you can see, you get kind of like this cavity carved out of the wind of this one star due to the wind of the second star. And so what the color is actually showing you here in this plot is it's showing you, uh, the color is just telling you how much stuff is coming off the star. So yellow and orange are lots of stuff, and then bluish is less stuff. Um, and then the distance is just um, a distance measured in units of the separation between the Earth and the Sun. So an AU or an astronomical unit is just equal to the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. And so this simulation is probably roughly the size of the solar system, give or take, okay? Now, where it gets interesting is I'm gonna play this movie and what's gonna happen is you're gonna see the stars move around counterclockwise from above. And this is gonna be a very elliptical orbit. So for most of the orbit, not much happens. The material is just coming off of the stars and the stars are happy, but eventually the stars go around each other really, really fast, and you get this beautiful kind of Archimedean spiral structure that gets carved out. And the reason for that is because the stars are actually, they start off moving slow, but Kepler's laws of planetary motion say that as the two stars get closer and closer together in their elliptical orbit, they move faster and faster and faster, until eventually the stars are orbiting at roughly the same speed that the material is coming off of the stars and the winds don't have time to respond. And so you get this beautiful spiral shape. Okay, so that's the left hand side. So what's going on in the right hand side? So on the right hand side, we have temperature on a logarithmic scale um, in units of Kelvin. And the blue stuff is basically just the normal temperature of the wind, roughly 10,000 Kelvin. Now, remember this material is coming off of the stars at millions of miles an hour. And when that stuff slams together, right, all of that energy, all of that kinetic energy in the motion of the winds has to go somewhere. And where it goes is into heat. It heats up the gas, right? So another way to think about it is if I clap my hands really hard, you get the sound. Now here there's really no sound because it's in space and there's no medium to propagate the sound. But if you clap your hands really hard, you feel that tingling, right? And then you also feel, you should, like if you were to measure the temperature of your hands, you would notice that it's actually slightly warm, right? The kinetic energy of clapping your hands together, right? You've suddenly stopped it, stopped the motion of your hands, but that energy from the motion of your hands has to go somewhere. Part of it is the sound, the clap that we hear, but then the other part is heating up your hands, right? The same thing here. So the gas gets heated to 10 million Kelvin. That's pretty hot last time I checked. Um, it's actually so hot, it glows in x-rays. And that's how we know that this phenomenon happens is we actually have x-ray telescopes in space and we can see this, we can see this emission. Now, this will, I'll come back to this, it's actually a little bit of a puzzle, but there's another part where the material gets really, really dense, and that stuff bounces around and collides a lot, and it will also give off infrared, inf uh, radiation in the form of like infrared radiation, and the stuff will cool off, and it will actually cool off very, very, very fast. Um, and that is actually gonna be the key point of the talk. Okay, so what we think happens is as these two stars go around, they form that kind of spiral shape that I just showed you in the simulations. And then as those spirals flow outward away from the stars, they, um, they're dense, 
they cool off, and then eventually we think that they cool off to the point where the atoms and, and stuff can cool, where they can form molecules, and then those molecules can coalesce to form um, what we call dust. Um, I bet you never thought you would spend your evening to go out to hear someone talk to you about dust, <laughs> right? Um, now, this dust is a little different. It's not quite the same as the dust in your house. Um, it's more like smoke. Um, so not to use, it's not a great analogy, but um, we've all experienced the wildfires in California, right? You know, when those particulates get put up into the air and it can make like the sky turn orange, that's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. That's what I mean when I refer to dust. It's, it's almost like smoke or particulates from a fire. Okay, so where it gets really cool is, um, so this is an image from a um, infrared telescope, the Keck telescope. This is uh, data that was taken from the ground. And what you are seeing here is a binary star system that is in a circular orbit. And the glow that you're seeing here is emission from that dust that forms in the outflows of the stellar winds. Um, so this is a uh, phenomenon that we have observed. Um, this particular system has a 220 day orbit. Its distance is about almost two and a half thousand parsecs from Earth, uh, where a parsec is about three and a third light years. Um, and again, the size of this is maybe a couple times the size of the solar system. Um, so we actually can see this dust and we can see it spiraling around. Um, but what's interesting is we really only see this dust formation um, in these binary systems where one of the stars is an O-type star, and the other star is this wolf ray type star. But one thing that's important to know is that there are actually a couple different types of wolf ray stars that are classified by um, what elements you happen to see in their atmospheres, and those elements are due to um, the nuclear processing. Um, and the particular type that we see are what are called the uh, carbon-rich WC stars. So these are stars where when we look at them and we look at their spectra, we see strong signatures for carbon. Um, they're deficient in hydrogen. So their, their hydrogen envelopes and stuff have been blown off into space. And we're seeing a lot of the carbon enhancement due to the um, nuclear reaction that happens to happen inside of massive stars that makes carbon and it kind of gets dredged up near the surface where it can get blown out in its stellar wind. <laughs> Okay, so the key, one of the key questions here is, um, so we see these things, we study them, we know that they can put dust out into the interstellar environment, but one of the key questions we want to know is, um, can this stuff, can these types of systems have been dust factories in the early universe? And the reason that's an important question is that we think that the very, very first stars that existed in the universe after the Big Bang and the Big Bang had time to cool, were very massive stars. And when I say very massive, I mean more massive than anything we've ever seen in the local universe. We're talking hundreds to possibly thousands of times the mass of the sun. Um, the reason for that is complicated because of just the abundances that were available um, when stars could form. But in any case, we want to know if um, the precursors for like life and dust and making future stars and planets could have come from these types of systems. Okay, so you don't have to worry about the top part. Um, the top part is just saying that we have papers that say, yep, yeah, we can make, we can, we've done simulations that show that these things can make dust. The key questions that we are trying to answer are, do we actually understand how dust forms in these environments? It's kind of an astrochemistry question as opposed to an astrophysics question. And then the other thing is actually a big mystery, which is how does the dust form and survive in these hostile environments. Now, what I mean by that is these stars, remember I said they're very massive, they're very bright, and they're very hot. So these things are pumping out lots and lots of hard ultraviolet radiation constantly, and that stuff is hitting all of this material that's around it. We don't understand how that's possible, just to be blunt with you. So, this stuff should not survive. The radiation from these stars being so near, it should just hit that stuff and just rip it apart. 
is to just destroy it. Um, and we honestly don't understand how this stuff survives and gets pushed out into space. So that was one of the big questions that we wanted to answer. And then also we wanted to know what is this stuff made of? Um, and I'll get to that. Okay, so how do you do it? Well, you build yourself a multi-billion dollar telescope <laughs> over about 20 or 30 years, and you get, uh, you put it on a big rocket, and then you send it in space. Um, so part of the James Webb mission is to answer questions like this, and we were extremely fortunate to be one of only 13 teams in the world that got some of the very first science with James Webb, and this was one of, that, one of those programs. Um, so the idea was to try and answer these questions using the James Webb Space Telescope. So for those of you, so how many of you here are familiar with James Webb? Good, so I don't have to spend a lot of time on this slide. <laughs> so James Webb is a um, infrared space-based telescope, one of NASA's flagship missions. Um, it's at, so here is, an, is a picture of the orbit where James Webb is going around to L2 as um, linked to the Earth as the Earth goes around the sun. Um, and then basically, yeah, we put it out really far away, so it's nice and cold, and we can um, get observations um, in the infrared so that we can study objects like this, but also exoplanets and distant galaxies and all of that. So what are we going to study? So the object that we picked was this, bi this very, very well-known binary star system, uh, well-known in the astrophysics massive star community, um, called WR140. So WR140 is considered the Rosetta Stone of colliding wind binaries. Uh, what I mean by that is we have lots of observations up from the ground where we've um, watched the stars go around. We've been able to determine their orbits. We have the orbital orientation um, figured out very accurately. Um, we know what these stars are. We have good estimates of their masses. We know what the period is, what the eccentricity is. We want to eliminate as many unknowns as possible, is basically what I'm saying, right? Was that the khaki image? Uh, where? Which one? The previous uh, movie? Um, no, the Keck image, this image is actually of a different system. I will show you what WR140 looks like. It's really difficult to get images like movies like this for WR140, unfortunately, because the period is so long. Um, the period is almost eight years. So unfortunately, no big astronomical observatory will let you point at one object for eight years. Um, I wish, but unfortunately, no. Um, so yeah, so, but the good news is, is that we don't need to watch at the whole orbit. We really only care, and I'll, I'll go back and replay this slide. Whoops, if I can. If you watch the, no, the animation doesn't work right now. Um, Never mind. So in any case, um, the dust formation in WR140 is interesting because it only happens when the two stars are closest together. And that also doesn't kind of make sense. You're like, well, if, why does the dust form when the two things are closest together? Wouldn't that mean that it's like hotter there and that the stuff should get destroyed? Yes and no. Um, so we have, so this is an actual image of WR140 shortly after one of its dust formation episodes. Um, the central binary, actually, we cannot resolve. You can't actually resolve the central binary. Um, it's still too far and, and they're too bright. Um, but you can see the arcs of dust. So this was done with the Subaru telescope in 2020. And the central unresolved binary is the bright spot at the center. And then here is one of these dust arcs. And so we picked WR140 because it's kind of like this ideal astrophysical laboratory where we can study the dust formation and, and kind of see when it comes out. So the idea was to try and catch one of these episodes um, and image it, but then also because JWST is so powerful, we wanted to see if we could see older arcs that are a little bit farther out to give us a, an idea of the history and if the stuff can survive. Um, so the idea was, oh, and then also one other thing that I want to mention is we also were going to take spectra to try and figure out and identify what the stuff is made of. So that's also important. So not only just to get the pretty pictures, but also to figure out what the stuff is made of, and then to do that to try and um, develop some sort of template to try and understand um, the interstellar medium. 
So you may be saying, this is great, but why would anyone care to do this? Um, one of the things that one of the main reasons we were chosen to do this project was because remember that dust, the dust emission is going to be very faint and we have a very bright star for some. And one of the things that people are very interested in doing with James w JWST is looking at things like exoplanet systems, um, distant galaxies. So looking for faint stuff or where there's a, something bright at the center, right? So we need to figure out a way. We wanted to test the capabilities of JWST to see, well, can we look at stuff where, like, you know, you want to look for planets around a star, right? It's hard because the star is there and it's so bright, it just washes out the planets. So you need to figure out a way, you know, how can I subtract out the bright star at the center so I can see the planets or the disk that the planets are forming from that type of stuff, right? So that was the other science goal of this. Okay, so um, for those of you who are astronomers, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but basically what we did is we picked um, a particular date and the instruments, the wavelength range, so that we could look for the dust formation. Um, and we, the date that we got was at an orbital phase of about 0.7, which is about five and a half years after when the last dust formation episode happened. Now, originally we were going to try to get earlier, but unfortunately, JWST was delayed a couple of times. And so we had no choice but to just either, it was either do it now or we're going to have to wait even longer because of that eight year period, right? So we decided we're just going to go with it and see what we can get. Now, the thing that I want to note before we see the results is that our predictions were that the observations we got of W140 were predicted to be at least a factor of a hundred better than anyone had ever done with any instrument anywhere at any time. So that's what we were expecting. So we expected to see maybe six or seven shells of material from um, past ejections. Okay, so we saw a hell of a lot more. <laughs> um, this just goes to show you just how well James Webb was built. Um, we were blown away. So what are we seeing? So on the left is the actual image. Um, the binary star system is at the very center, but you'll notice that it's kind of like weird. It looks kind of like blotchy and blocky a little bit. That's because that's where we did that subtraction of trying to subtract out the central binary so that we could actually see the dust emission shows. Now the images on the right are a zoom in of just that very, very central region with the color bar adjusted so that we can see the central binary and the first most recent arc of dust formation. Okay, so a couple of things I want to point out. The first, you'll notice these blue spikes. These are not real. Well, they're real in the sense that yes, they're in the image, but they are not due to anything happening in WR140. So if you look at James Webb, you'll notice that there's the big primary mirror, and then there, there's this um, secondary mirror, and then there are these like poles that hold that up. When the light comes in, it diffracts around the, the structure that holds up that secondary mirror, and it produces these diffraction spikes. So these diffraction spikes, these blue spikes, are due to the design of the telescope, and there's not much we can do about it. But these other structures, um, they're all real, as far as we can tell. Um, and each one is from a different time when WR140 formed dust in its colliding winds. And as I'll show later, the spacing between them is exactly 7.93 years, the, the period of the binary, right? Uh, and then if you want to get an idea of the scale, um, here's the scale bar. Um, so 20,000 AU, so about a couple orders of magnitude larger than our solar system, right? Okay, so I will talk about some of these features. So one of the things you'll notice also right away is that this isn't a perfectly symmetric image, right? There are very good reasons for that, which I will explain in a second. Um, now, the first thing is, uh, I just want to identify a couple of features. So this is the same image as I showed you before on the left, but with a different color scale, it's a gray scale. And then we have um, the yellow. We did this because we wanted to highlight what we knew was due to instrumental artifacts from the design of the telescope. And we wanted to be able to tell the difference between what are just 
artifacts from the design of a telescope versus what's real, okay? And what we found are that there are these interesting structures. There's this one that kind of goes down diagonally a little bit to the left. There's one that kind of goes um, a little bit di up diagonally from the right, almost at about one o'clock. And then there's this one that goes down to the, to the bottom, uh, to the bottom right. As far as we can tell from all the work that we've done, all of these are real and they are not due to any known possible instrumental artifact in JWST. Um, you may say, okay, well, maybe I don't believe you. I'm gonna prevent, present a little bit more convincing argument in a slide or two. Okay, so that's the image. Next, what we wanted to do is we wanted to know what is this stuff made of? So what we did is we zoomed in on one of these recently formed arcs of material near the central binary, and we took a spectrum of it with JWST. Uh, the dashed circle is just where we took our background image so that we could do background subtraction. And then um, what you see here um, on, the, on the top right is the entire um, spectral energy distribution with a um, continuum fit, and then we have the different um, spectral lines. There is one that's due to an, uh, an instrumental artifact, but then we have one line here that is due to um, forbidden silicon, uh, sulfur four. And then what we're going to actually look at is the stuff near the shorter end of the wave band. Um, and that's this zoom down here. And what I've marked for you is that, so I don't have the time really to go into the details of the astrochemistry, and I'm also not exactly an astrochemistry expert, but the astrochemists on the team who worked on this looked at this, and basically what they found is that this spectral feature, uh, just shortward of 6.5 microns, we think is due to um, large carbonational molecules or potentially small um, hydrogen-free carbonaceous grains. Um, and then this other big feature we think is due to um, the carbon-carbon stretching mode in what are these, these things that are called um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So PAHs for short are um, basically complex groupings of hydrogen and carbon atoms that are the precursors for things like um, eventually like amino acids and stuff like that. They're, they're complex hydrocarbons. And this um, stretching mode basically just means that um, the bonds between the carbon-carbon atoms act almost like springs or rubber bands, and they kind of stretch and oscillate, and the um, releases energy, and um, we see that here. And then there are these things that are famous, they're called um, unidentified IR features, and we think that they are due to, um, well, uh, that we think that these things that are attributed to these um, carbon hydrogen twist bending bonds, um, we didn't really, we didn't really see them. So the bottom line is, is what we found, and there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, um, but we did find that there are carbonaceous molecules and complicated hydrocarbons that are forming um, in this dust. Okay, so the next thing we wanted to do is we wanted to say, okay, well, how good are we doing in actually understanding what's going on? So um, no good observation is, um, you know, uh, you know uh, so every good observation needs a good model is what I'm trying to say. So we put together a simple geometric model to try and model the dust emission and the geometry to see if we can reproduce what we see with James Webb. So what we're seeing here is um, the image on the left is um, if you could look down, kind of, uh, if you could look at the binary orbit um, as the two stars go around and as they emit dust, how would that shell of dust exist around the binary system? So here uh, in the upper right is the inset that shows how the two stars go around. Um, here is the, uh, how it would look on the sky. And basically, the orientation of the binary has it so that it's inclined um, a, certain away, a certain amount away from us. And then there's a position angle of the binary relative to us here on Earth. Um, and so the dust shell actually forms here. So here would be the head of the dust shell. And then the best way to think about it is it would come out and form a torus that kind of comes out of the screen and then moves back into the screen and then wraps up around under the screen. Does, does that make sense? 
Maybe. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Um, anyway, and then here, here's another illustration of it, right? So um, if the observer was over to the right, looking to the left, here is what the dust shell would look like. Um, so basically what we did is we took this dust shell, fed it into, uh, we, we generated multiple of these, fed it into a code that says, okay, um, imagine that this is our binary system, simulate what James Webb would see. Observation on the left, Model on the right. So, and it's a pretty simple model. There was like no complicated supercomputer simulation or anything done for this. It was just assume dust formation at these times, wrap it around from what we know the orientation of the orbit is, feed it through the simulated telescope. And we got it. I mean, it, it came out. Um, and we were like, wow, this is, this is amazing. Um, but here's the thing. It matches the asymmetry. We reproduce the asymmetric features um, that we said were not due to instrumental artifacts, right? And then obviously the instrumental stuff would be the stuff here, but we didn't we didn't put that in. Um, if you want to see it on a different color scale, here it is. Um, observation on the left, model assuming 20 dust shells on the right. And like I said, um, for, a, for a very simple model, it does um, a pretty amazing job. Um, so good news is, is it looks like we might actually know a little bit of something about the universe and a little bit of something about how these stars work. Um, now, what we are working towards now is actually doing the supercomputer simulations from first principles to see if we can get this to work. Um, that's complicated for a number of different reasons, um, but we, we are working on it. Okay, so the other thing is um, measuring the cadence, like the cadence of these shells. So each one of these colored lines is um, a plot of the emission of where the dust shells sit um, in different wave bands. Um, so looking at it at different um, wavelengths. And then uh, the bottom one is just uh, what we get from our model, our, our very simple model. And we're not trying to reproduce exactly like the, the, the exact flux or anything. Um, we just wanted to see if we could get everything to match up in terms of the timing. Um, and it does. And what's amazing is, is what we're actually seeing with James Webb is the, those most distant dust shells, they, are, they were formed about 130 years ago. We're seeing stuff that was formed over a century ago. That's how good James Webb is. Now, there is a caveat we actually pushed James Webb to its observational limit. Just because we only saw about 20 shells doesn't mean that there's only 20 shells. 20 shells is only all we could see with JWST. In reality, there are probably more and more shells that go farther and farther out. They're just too faint and distant and cold that we just can't see them with James Webb. So um, we have hit the signal to noise detection limit of JWST with these observations. Um, but the most important point is we have shown that this dust can form and survive in these really harsh environments and make it out into the distant interstellar medium without being destroyed. Um, and that is very important for, again, understanding the chemical enrichment of the universe and where does the stuff that forms stars, future stars and planets all come from, right? Um, so we've shown that it, it is possible. Now, the other thing that I want to say real briefly is um, we wanted to do something really cool. So I'm happy to talk to you afterwards if you're interested in learning more about this other project that I spent a lot of time working on. But one of the things I'm interested in is how do we bring these pretty pictures to people who are blind or visually impaired? Right, so there's astronomy is awesome and you can do see lots of pretty pictures and learn a lot of stuff about the universe, but how do you explain this to someone who can't see, right? So one of the things that I spend a lot of work on is trying to figure that out. How do I teach astronomy and astrophysics to someone who is blind? So I do a lot with 3D printing and I spend a lot of time developing 3D models to teach astronomy concepts, but also trying to figure out ways to 3D print astronomical images. So we took our James Webb image and we sent it to uh, someone at Caltech 
who helped to remove all of the background noise. So basically they took out all the background stars that are in the background or the foreground, took out all the noise, cleaned things up nicely so that we could take this image and then use the brightness to create uh, a tactile relief of the image. So here would be the 3D model. And then once you have a 3D model of your image, you can send it to your 3D printer um, and you can 3D print it. And here it is. So I'm going to come down and pass these around and you are more than welcome to touch them because that is exactly what they're designed for. But if you have access to a 3D printer and you would like to print it yourself, there is a link to the 3D model file freely available for anyone to 3D print. I will just run down real quick. This out. So I will start with one here and I will start with one here. And again, if you would like to know more about this, I am happy to tell you because one of the things that I do and spend a lot of time on is I travel around the country in the summer doing week-long astronomy camps for students who are blind and visually impaired all over the country. So this made uh, a lot, This we had a lot of press for this, so if you want to go online, you can read more about this on NASA's webpage. Um, we made the astronomy picture of the day, and to our PI's great, um, a big boost of pride for him and us, we made the cover of nature, of nature astronomy with our, with our image. So we received a lot of, a lot of, um, it was very well received. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up here in 30 seconds. So here's a summary of our image, our zoomed images, um, our spectra, but basically what it boils down to is yes, these um, carbon rich binaries can form carbonaceous dust via their colliding stellar winds. JWST has the power and sensitivity for us to study this dust in detail. It can survive and propagate into the interstellar medium. Um, thus, we think these binaries can be an early and important source of dust in especially the early universe, but perhaps even the local universe. Um, but the puzzle that still remains is we're still not entirely clear of how the dust survives deep, deep down close to the star. Um, and we're not exactly sure yet on all of the exact astrochemical mechanisms. So that is, is work, in progress, uh, work in progress. But I can tell you that we do have other observations that were taken of this system, um, looking at the time evolution. And maybe there'll be other interesting results coming out sometime in the not too distant future. I guess you'll just have to um, keep an eye on it. <laughs> So thank you so much. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Yes, I saw your hand. Yep. Go first. So the question was, can you give us a sense of how much dust is formed uh, every cycle? Um, that is a very good question that I not sure if I know exactly off the top of my head for this system. Um, I would say it's, so we usually reference these things in terms of um, solar masses per year, but it's probably only, I would say it's probably no more than 10 to the minus five or six. Um, so probably on, on that order, I can maybe go back and see if maybe I had it somewhere or maybe I have it um, somewhere else. I'm sure if you look at the paper, it should say in the actual. So this paper is also, um, the Nature Astronomy paper is available online and it should be freely accessible. So you're also welcome to check that out. But I don't see if it says exactly. Yeah, so yeah, it varies. So I would say here like 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the minus six per year, somewhere, somewhere in that range. How, how massive is the Earth compared to the sun? How massive is the Earth compared to the Sun? I'm just trying to get a sense of how many Earth gases that would be. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> um, there are some awesome, so I saw one that there's this awesome YouTube video that someone just put together that shows like um, if you had the Sun as a giant bowl and you just wanted to fill it with Earths, how many it would actually take. So, um, 
Yeah, so it's yeah, it's something like that. So so let's see. So the so the sum is like two times ten to the thirty-three grams, and then just yeah, just roughly divide that by the mass of the Earth, and there you go. Um, and it's like oh, it's about one hundred and nine Earths across. So yeah, a lot. So these things are um, yeah. So if you go back to the to the first image, um, so the Earth would be this like. Maybe a couple pixels. Other questions? Yeah, please, Jason. Sure. Do you have any examples of when you've used these three D models uh, for helping blind or visually impaired? Uh, any examples of reactions that you've gotten? Um, so yeah, I mean everyone loves them. Um, sighted and unsighted both love them because there's just something I think intrinsic about human nature where we just like to hold things and feel things and look at things from different angles. Um, and I can give you some background on how I got into this work. Um, so I had no, like my original training and background, I didn't work with like special ed students or, or anything else like that. I was pure scientist by training. Um, and I was working on um, a project actually, if you're interested, it was to um, create a 3D model of a nebula around a, it was actually, whoops, I passed it. Now it's going too fast. Uh, I worked on a project to do this nebula here on the right called the Ada Carina Homunculus Nebula. We created a 3D model of that um, when I worked at NASA um, probably all about 10 years ago. Um, and we 3D printed it for fun because no one had ever done that yet. Um, and we were showing it around on site at NASA to people to get their perspectives on it. And I met a gentleman who worked in the um, Office of Education at Goddard Space Flight Center. His name is Ken Silverman. He's a fantastic guy. He's a former computer programmer for the Navy. Um, he's an engineer. He's a registered patent attorney in the state of Maryland. He's completely blind. And he's been blind since high school. And he did all of that blind. Went to college, passed the bar, got an engineering degree, done computer programming. He's amazing. He does rock climbing. He does kayaking. He, did, like, he does not let it stop in, in, by any stretch of the imagination. And we showed this to him, and he was the one who gave, me the, uh, gave us the idea and was like, you know, this would be a fantastic way to like reach out to students. And, you know, especially students like himself, who were, you know, are visually impaired, to teach them about astronomy and give them a way to see astronomical objects, right? Because if I tell you about a planet or a star, or a galaxy, right? If you're if you're blind, like what does that mean to you, right? You have no concept of it. So um, he was the one who got me involved, um, and we've just taken it and run with it. And I still work with him um, to this day, and it's been about ten years now. Um, and we're very fortunate. We have a um, our our my program that I have is sponsored by the National Science Foundation, um, and like I said, so we, we we that's where we get the funding for this project. Um, yeah. I, what did you say his name was? I have a friend who's visually impaired. Yes, his name is Ken Silverman. So, uh, S I L B E R N A N. And he works where? Uh, NASA Goddard oh. Space Flight Center in, in Greenbelt, Maryland. Um, he, yeah, I think you in the middle. Yeah, you're the church. Yeah, so while you're on the slide, tell me um, how much maybe you said this. Um, so I can't speak to that personally because that wasn't exactly the part of the project that I was on, but just knowing from like our team meetings and stuff, um, it wasn't too, too bad, um, mainly because um, Space Telescope Science Institute, which runs the, um, the, the space telescopes for NASA, they have a whole dedicated team of engineers and scientists who work on the data processing routines. And um, they had done like, they, they basically simulate everything multiple, multiple times, even before the launch. They test the instruments on Earth before they get set up. So they have a decent idea of how things are supposed to work. Um, so it, it, it's, almost, it's almost not as many surprises. So we kind of plan ahead even before, um, before you know. This. So for instance, this proposal to do these observations was accepted on the order of two to three years before James Webb even launched. So we knew that we were, the science was coming, it was just when and then what, what quality, right? 
Um, but it, it is a lot of work. It takes time to develop those routines, and then there's always weird things that you don't see. So I can happy to tell you, but there are like artifacts and hot pixels and cosmic rays and all kinds of stuff, um, and then other things, micrometeorite impacts. Um, so you know this thing is in space, and the mirrors do get hit by rocks um, while they while it's in space, and um, every so often they actually. Um, so I can say this because it's kind of a cool thing. Um, if you look at the design, right, so here's the main mirror and then here's the secondary mirror, they can actually back out and they can actually take a picture of the main mirror using the secondary mirror so that they can see where all of the micrometeorite impacts and stuff are so that they can subtract those out. Um, and, and you have to do that. Yes. Good question. So it is um, about 1.6 thousand parsecs. So it's pretty nearby as far as um, stellar systems go. So it's 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 local in our galaxy. Yes. How many hours did this project take on the big uh, space telescope? Um, that is also a good question. So I can go here and um, let's see. So the observing time. So, yeah, so it was on the order of um, it was on the order of hours, hours on the order of hours of time. Yeah. So you don't you don't you can't get a ton of time on, with with these instruments because they're just so competitive. Um, but yeah, so the observations were taken on um, on two days of July 2022. So the um, the imager was um, the uh, let's see if I get this right. It's here on the slide. So the spectrometer did the images first on July 8th, and then um, the imaging was done on July 27th. Of questions. I don't know who the. <laughs> I'm trying to go by who I see whose hand goes up first, but maybe all the way in the in the back of the top. Yeah, thank you. Just to be clear, the carbon atoms are fused in the Wolverine star or a result of the dust collision. Um, the the carbon is coming from the Wolverine star itself. And then the molecules are. Yeah, and then the, and then so basically what happens is, is it gets it basically gets um blown out off of the star via its stellar wind into space, and then. When the winds collide, that stuff gets really close together and it gets really dense. And so I didn't have a chance to really go into the details of the physics, but basically what ends up happening is, is that stuff gets really dense and then it does what's called um, radiative cooling. And you get kind of a runaway effect where the stuff cools and it gets denser and then that makes it colder and then it gets denser, which makes it radiate more radiation. And, it cool. and so what ends up happening is, is as the temperature drops, the atomic motions slow down so that they can eventually come together and bond. And then those things slow down and then they eventually bond. And so it's a gradual process where you start with just like the carbon atoms themselves. And then as things cool, you get um, these more complicated and more complicated molecules. So it's not just carbon, it was carbon and other elements. Yeah, we think that these most of these things are carbon and, and, and hydrogen. So these things that are called like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, but they have they can be there are all different types of them and they all have different um, they all have different structures and various numbers of atoms and then the different bonds between them. But it's yeah, it's mostly carbonaceous, so it's mostly carbon dominated, as opposed to say um, some of the stuff that you see in the interstellar medium which is um, made of what we call silicates, which would be things that are like silicon and oxygen that are bonded together. So those carbonaceous molecules are the ones that make crystal light? In theory, yes, but we honestly don't completely understand how that works. But they are, they are um, we, we feel that they are um, precursors in some sense. Um, at the very least, they're what you need in order to form rocks so that you can form planets. Hi, <laughs> yeah. It's a wolf. Uh, yeah. I apologize if this is a little out of your but in the meeting you were talking about how um, smaller stars are mostly, their, their solar wind is mostly dominated by the kind of statistics of, of the gaseous 
objects? Yeah, it's mostly gas pressure. And larger ones were dominated by um, radiation supernovas. Yes. Uh, my question is, um, um, maybe like, what's the transition between those two processes? Or that's a that's a very good question. Uh, so the, the the main the main things are um, it gets a little complicated in terms of the uh, so what it boils down to are two things it's the um, it's the luminosity and then it's the chemical abundances so actually to drive these winds what you really need are metals so in astronomy astronomers have this lovely thing I'm sure most of you know that anything that's not hydrogen and helium is basically a metal. So you really need the higher order elements. And the reason for that is the higher order elements have more bound electrons. And those more bound electrons have more possible transitions. And the more possible transitions you have, the more you can get um, coupling between the radiation field and the atoms, right? And so what we call this is we call this line driving. So it's called a, it's called a line driven stellar wind because you're using the spectral lines. Um, and then you, so what it comes down to is what's called opacity. So opacity is, uh, in simple terms, it's um, how efficient something absorbs or interacts with radiation. And in these massive stars, you really need kind of those heavy elements in their atmospheres. And then you can also get some opacity um, in the continuum part of the spectrum due to what's called electron scattering. So basically, because you, you have a hot plasma, you have a lot of free electrons. And then the radiation, you know, that, that can help with driving. So, um, yeah, so basically that's what it boils down to is this, the, you need an intense radiation field, really, really strong radiation field. And then you need to have the, um, the heavy elements. This is actually, but it's a really great question because this is why we think that the early first stars in the universe were very, very massive. Is So if you go out with the local universe, you never really, you, we've never seen a star above a couple hundred solar masses. They just do not exist. We don't see them. And we think the reason for that is there's a balance when a star forms between the radiation and the stuff that can fall in to form the star. And what, if you get too massive of a star, basically what happens is the radiation is so strong, it can't accumulate any more material to grow. Now, in the early universe, you only had hydrogen and helium and like the smallest amount of lithium, which didn't matter. There's no metals. So now there's no line driving. So now the star can just grow and grow and grow. And we think that, that that's what happens. Um, we don't know for sure because we don't have any instrument powerful enough to see a first generation star. So we'll just have to wait and see if this holds up, but that is, that is the idea. Sure, yep. I was uh, great job, by the way. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I was wondering, uh, in order to do these computational calculations, uh, how important is this? So I guess the question is, is which, which type of simulations are you referring to specifically? Uh, the ones where you simulate uh, the bands that they match the experimental uh, data. Oh, you mean like like the like the images or the or the yeah, spectrum? Like, uh, images. Yeah. So for the images, it doesn't really matter too much. We basically just um, well, it matters a little bit. It depends on how deep into the details you want to go. Um, I think for this, we just kind of kept it really simple, and we just said. Um, this is the dust emission, and we didn't try to match the, the exact flux that was detected. We just tried to get the relative flux, right? So, like, basically, we, we normalized it so that we were just trying to match the exact features, right? Um, but you're right. If you want to get, like, the exact flux exactly right, um, or if you want to try to model the spectra, then that you, you have to make assumptions um, not only about the chemical composition, but it gets even more complicated because uh, you have to know something about the sizes of the dust grains, um, their temperature, their density. Um, you have to account for all of these things. Um, and to be honest with you, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a nightmare. Um, and that's why like molecular spectroscopy and stuff like that for a long time, only now that we're getting the, the instruments and the tools and the computers, we're doing that because for a long time, astronomers stayed away from that because it's just, so nasty, it's so complicated because you have so many different, these molecules, they can vibrate, they can rotate, they can bend, they have translational motion, and you have to get all of those details right in addition to the chemical abundances, and it's, it's a pain. 
So for this, we usually assume close to, well, I have to be careful. Normally, we, we assume like solar type abundances, but what we actually do now is we do stellar evolution codes to figure out like what would be produced in the immediate environment and then try to put that in. So we have a follow-up question back right here. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, we, we try to base these things on known like experimental or other observational. So um, there is, I don't know what the current state of laboratory astrophysics is, but for a long time there used to be labs that would, that would try to do these things. But the problem is, is that you can't exactly simulate space environments in a lab on Earth. You just can't get densities that low, no matter how hard you try. We don't have vacuums that are that strong. Um, so uh, a lot of what we'll do is we'll also, we'll look at other places where we've where we've seen these and where we know what they are, right? So nebulae, for example, or um, like eruptions from massive stars that are getting ready to go supernova, or um, AGB stars, so asymptotic giant branch stars that also produce dust in their in their atmospheres, and then we'll try to you know compare to those and that that type of thing. But it is a good point because there are things that exist in space that we just we, we don't know what they are because we can't see them. We, we have no reference here on Earth because they can't exist here. Um, so yeah, so that's when the that's when the theory comes into play. See, two more questions. I'm, that you may take. <laughs> I see two hands, so that's perfect. So on the left. So do you mean with this particular system or just in general? What, what would you personally want to see? Um, unfortunately, the object that I would like to see, or that I would really like to study, I, they can't point James Webb at it because we'll break the telescope. <laughs> <laughs> so the object I've spent most of my career studying was the one that had that bipolar nebula. It's called Eta Carina. Unfortunately, Eta Carina, it's, it's a southern hemisphere object. You unfortunately can't see it here in the northern hemisphere. But it's the brightest object in the infrared sky, and we were told you can't point our telescope at it. So we're trying to figure out ways to maybe still do it somehow. Um, but it's a work in progress, and I don't. Yeah, it's it's a work in progress. But that I've spent most of my career studying just that one object, um, and I'm happy to talk about it at some point because it's an amazing. It's it's very similar to W. Basically, it's WR140 on steroids. That's the best way to say it. It's literally WR140 on steroids. So. Yeah, I would, I would like to point at Ada, at, Ada, at Ada Carina, because one of the big mysteries about Ada Carina is exactly what it is. It's the only object like it in the whole galaxy. Um, and it's a very it's a very rare object, but it's a very fascinating and mysterious object. Um, and we don't know exactly what it is. The current understanding is we, have, we think that we happened to catch it at a time. We think it was actually a triple system where two of the stars spiraled in and merged together and had an explosion. That's what that's the current best guess, but we don't know for sure. And then I saw yes. Uh, yeah, so what is not in the model that we made that we created the spiral pattern mm -hmm. and also recreated the so the three spikes and, I, and again it's that's why it's the source of those uh, spikes. Yes, okay, so I, I yeah, I kind of sped through that for the sake of time, but what it boils down to is um, the best way to think about it is this image here. So imagine if you had a donut. The best way to think about it is imagine you took half a donut, half a torus, and you were looking at it at a particular angle. Okay? What we see in terms of the dust emission isn't just the donut projected on the sky. It's emission from everywhere on the donut added up or integrated in line of sight between us and infinity. So what you're seeing with those particular features is just, it ha it, it, what it boils down to is it just has to do with the orientation of the binary and the dust emitting structure on the sky relative to us here on Earth. Because no matter what people may tell you, we're not, ex we don't think we're special in terms of the universe, right? We just happen to be here and there's no preferred orientation or direction, 
right? And so the WR140 binary can be any orientation in 3D space with respect to us that it wants to be. And it happens that it's just at this particular set of angles so that when we add up all the dust emission, it adds up so that when it's projected on the sky, it gives us those features. Um, I, hope, I hope that makes sense. Sure. That was something I asked earlier, and so I, I looked up, and it's about a tenth of a fifth Earth masses to one solar mass. Yeah, that sounds so about right. right. Just trick it down that out. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you again for coming out. I really appreciate it. Astronomers, I do want to say thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, it's been absolutely it, it, it was so thrilling to be back in person <laughs> yes, again. So thank you. So. Um, just a few closing announcements. First, and did you have any? You're going to talk about two months from now? The next lecture? Yes. Oh, yes. That's one of them. Okay. But but first, most important announcement: there are approximately eight cookies left, which means you have maybe a uh, twenty fifteen percent chance of getting one. So that's the first announcement. <laughs> um, thank you. I believe it was uh, I, I believe it was Mrs. Uh, Kircher who I missed your first name. I'm sorry. There you go. Thank you for bringing those. If any of you do have kind of a vision for making this a more welcoming atmosphere, a welcome table, et cetera, it's something I wasn't able to take on this time, but if anyone has a vision for that, by all means, contact me. I'd love, love to help. We do have upcoming lectures. Uh, I want to preview a couple of them. The very next one, which is April, I believe April 3rd, but I'm not certain on that, um, is uh, Dr. Thomas Tajde, I believe, Taget, um, will be speaking about myths in Hollywood, astronomy myths, where Hollywood has gotten astronomy right and where it has not gotten it right. So it should be a very entertaining uh, lecture. Uh, two months after that, in June, we have a lecture, uh, I, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say who because I'm going to get it wrong, uh, talking about the concept of looking at galaxies, but looking at the microwave background radiation, how it can in back illuminate as if holding a letter up to it, uh, a window to see through the envelope. Uh, that's another way of analyzing galaxies. So some fascinating talks coming on. Uh, later, we have one lecture. She has spent uh, better, more than a year traveling the world, studying different people groups and how they have interpreted the Pleiades. Uh, the star formation. So we've got some really fascinating lectures coming up. So you can find out more about those. Uh, uh, the the website is probably the first place you can look. You can also find those out through Slack. There will be event rights, uh, notifications. Um, yeah, so we've got some good stuff coming up. Uh, and also the inverse of star parties, again, on our website. So thank you for coming out. And that, that's it.